Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net, and I'm going to be continuing my Fischer vs. Kasparov series on the Sicilian Night Dwarf, and in this video I'll be looking at the Bishop G5 line, so 6, Bishop G5. So this move order in this game, just opening up, a little bit goofy, but after Knight F6, this is the Night Dwarf and Bishop G5, so this is a very critical continuation in the Night Dwarf one of the most heavily analyzed uh, openings there is, and it's simply because it's just such an aggressive opening. So e6 is the standard continuation. Uh, going with e5 directly here is probably a mistake because you're just giving up so much control over d5 so early, and uh, I mean, even just capturing immediately. You know, let's say if queen takes knight d5, and this kind of tempo, this kind of fast play, very characteristic in the knight dwarf and his black, you certainly want to avoid it. So instead, e6 is going to be played similar to the fischer sozin variation uh, because, you know, you got to keep an eye on, on d5 and f5. So after f4, Bobby Fischer really just tore it up in his time by playing the poison pawn variation quite frequently. So he, he did mix it up, but this was kind of his main choice against his bishop g5 line. Extremely complicated system. I'm going to stay away from it. Because I think it's just too complicated. It's beyond the scope of this investigation. I mean, you know, this this is an example of the poison pawn. Black has accepted a pawn, and white, on the other hand, has nearly completed his development. You know, as you can see, it's a very imbalanced position, very dangerous stuff, and um, you know, it, it's just too crazy. I mean, if if you're gonna look into it, you need to spend a lot of time just on that. So instead, Fisher's other main choice was to play something of a delayed b5 system. Where with queen c7, you're keeping an eye on e5, and uh, now he's, he's waiting to play b5. Uh, a lot of times he would prefer development first in the center, more of a flexible setup, you could say a little less committal, and so now with b5, and uh, e5 can be greeted by bishop b7, no harm, no foul. So also delaying the b5 move, there are a good couple of lines in this bishop g5 line. Uh, this doesn't really work in this situation, but where white can sack a bishop, and if he can pick up the d6 pawn as well, uh, it's a very common piece set. Just wanted to point out something to keep an eye out for. But with this delayed b5, it doesn't really work. It, it, it's just not going to work. You know, there's no point. You can't pick up d6. So moving forward, bishop b3. You can see white is employing uh, a, a very aggressive setup. You know, I mean, very centralized. And after b4, Fisher is going to be pushing pushing white back. And I should mention here in this game, uh, the Romanian IM Octavio Troianescu is playing with the white pieces. Bobby Fisher is playing black, and this was played in Athenia in 1968. So b4 here, and this is, you know, typical night or stuff. I mean, you can't be scared to get a little fresh. Um, you know, I mean, just, just b4, you got to do it. You, you have to achieve the activity. Now, in some lines, white does prefer to play a3, but you normally don't want to move pawns in front of your king, uh, as this will give black something to latch on to in the future with a, a future b4 as well. So, anyway, b4 disrupts white's uh, coordination a little bit. And so, you know, going towards the center and h6. So you can see, I mean, both players, a lot of tension in this position, very very typical in the Night Dwarf system, as it's such a double-edged type of opening. And so here, White decides to give up his dark squared bishop, and Fisher takes with his bishop. First of all, it's pointing at the king. Also, it's it's impeding White from playing e5. You know, it's very important not to let him play e5. And so now queen e3. This was kind of a weird plan. Usually, uh, White would have played something along the lines of g4, maybe h4 even, but Troyanescu is going for just complete centralization and not trying to give his opponent any, any kind of dangerous attack. And so Fisher, queen c5, this is the type of move that is extremely underappreciated in, in this type of system. And when you've got the two bishops, you got the bishop pair, notably the dark square bishop, that's the key player in this game, moves like queen c5 are absolutely critical. Because positionally, as you remove White's queen, he's not going to be left with, with many defenders um, for, for his dark squares in his position. And so that's going to highlight your dark square's advantage even more. So we can also note, positionally, the knights are kind of clumsy. They're, they're kind of fighting for the same square here on d4. 
and that's not going for white either. So Troy Andescu plays Queen G1, which was quite strange. Uh, he didn't, you know, he's a little tied up. I mean, Queen C5 is money in the bank because he can't move the knight. You're going to lose that one. And he can't move this one because it's pinned to his queen. So he's he's got his hands tied. And so Queen G1, what else can you do? You know, he can't, he can't go Queen D2. You still lose the knight. There's no checks with the bishop, nothing. So uh, Queen G1 seems pretty much forced. So now G5 by Fisher, and he's trying to just loosen this, this position up, you know, and he was probably going to put his king here. And now this knight, this is the best score on the board for the knight. I mean, E5, is it's untouchable. So G5, a very nice break. I saw this in, in a lot of Fisher's games that I prepare for this series. And um, I, I think one thing that he was really good at was not castling too early in the knight order. He, he wasn't scared to leave his king in the center because a lot of times you don't have to move the king out of the center. You know, if it's not going to open, and as you go through the end game, positionally speaking, your king is going to be much better placed on e7 than anywhere else on the board. So g5, very nice, uh, just trying to open some more lines, and um, white kind of acquiesces, can't handle attention, and he he, take, he allows a, a queen trade. And so here, I, I really thought Fisher was going to take the pawn, but instead he played bishop d8, just the deepness. I mean, this... This type of positional maneuver, Fisher was was just so nasty. I, I mean, he never missed a two or three move combination, and he had all these these just insanely you know this is not insanely deep, but a very nice positional maneuver. Essentially, the only move in the position. I, I mean, the only move. I, if he takes here, here's a problem with taking is knight a five, and now you're hitting. This, where does the bishop go? There are questions that need to be answered. And uh, I, I, the bishop's got no squares. So bishop d8, perfectly timed. Just get the bishop. And now we're going to see how the bishops on the queen side just affect so much play in the center and on the king side. So white plays g3, which is important. If he plays f5, first of all, let's think. Light squared bishop, pawns on light squares. This is bad positional chess. And you've also permanently given away. The knight on e5 is untouchable such an influence on the position from, from a central square like this. You know, the knight on e5 is untouchable. So, instead of giving up the uh, surrendering his dark square integrity of his central pawns, white goes with g3. And, and this is uh, you know, a logical move. Keep the pawns on dark squares. The bishop can work with them, you know, if that's possible. <coughs> so with c3 here, he's trying to get the knight in the game. And why would black not want to push this pawn up? You know, get some, get some more activity. This trade definitely benefits black. And also the knight cannot come to c3. You know, very important. So bishop c2. And we can see Fisher's play leaves white struggling to find a plan. Because he, he's, his central position, you know, this is perfect. The king is so safe. Uh, the rook back to e1, but white doesn't have a dark squared bishop. So he's unable to play moves like e5 in the future. And, you know, even attacking this pawn is very difficult without the dark, without the dark squared bishop. So rook g8, Fisher was just, you know, do you want to play f5? He's kind of leaning on him. Do you want to play that? You know what I mean? Um, and so white does it. You know, he, he acquiesces again because this bishop is controlling g1. And white simply doesn't have time to block the bishop. And now it's too late to come over. And with this rook, the active rook here, uh, this rook maybe could come to the c file, or you can you know figure out how to maybe uh, try to double rooks on the second rank, for example. So anyway, that's why white plays f5. And so now Fisher achieved what he wanted positionally with rook g8. He's got the e5 square. All these pawns, very weak, very weak. But the bishops are just killing it. So knight c1. It was definitely kind of a strange move, but, you know, honestly, what is the knight going to do here? It's not really doing anything. I mean, I think maybe this was the best shot trying to get to b5, but I don't know. It's not, it's not that evident, you know, exactly. It's activity, though. I mean, it's better than nothing. I, I like that. Anyway, in the game, I tried knight to c1, and the idea was pretty good here, actually. I mean, after knight e5, knight d3, trading knights is definitely going to benefit white. 
You know, in this position, Black doesn't really want to trade any minor pieces because his pieces are working so well together. So here he plays knight f3 just in time. And, uh, yeah, I mean, the rook is... White is just getting killed. I mean, look at this bishop. This guy's hitting this pawn here. And if knight takes here, I mean, white's done. So he's got to go rookie two. And Fisher is just turning the screws. Bishop a6. Just look at the bishops. Just, just killing it. You know, black incurred no risk in this game with this quiet variation. White didn't play actively enough. And this is what happens in the Sicilian. A lot of times, you know, white does have a, a favorable center structure in the opening for achieving an initiative and, and stuff, but and, and trying to, you know, play play for an attack in the opening. But in the Sicilian, in the night orf like this, a lot of times black has the advantage in the end game just due to the basic solid structure of his pawns in the center. So, okay, so bishop a6. This is in the regular game, but still, I mean, Fisher is just killing this guy. So rook c4, attack, defend, <laughs> and uh, knight e1. So please trade pieces, what White is saying. You know, trading pieces is going to help him so much. So Fisher here, I think he could have played g4, but instead he just goes back with knight e5, and this is understandable. The knight is just so good here, and this knight can't come back to d3 because you're just going to take a pawn. So instead, rook d2. So black, uh, white doubles up. He gets some activity. Okay, just rook d8, defend. Both these rooks are kind of tied up. And this knight, you know, again, it can't move there. So, you know, there's not really any other options. It, anything like a3 would really just weaken white's position more than help, certainly. So instead, he goes f6, forces an exchange of rooks. And trading rooks didn't really diminish Black's pressure. You know, honestly, it, it, it did help White a little bit, as now, you know, Black's minor pieces are not going to be harassing White's rooks anymore. But on the flip side, you know, I, I, White is just, you know, it, it, these pawns are going to take a long time to activate. Meanwhile, Black's king is already there. And these pawns, I mean, the, the bishops are just so strong. So one thing about the two bishops, you know, White is offering to trade. Trading minor pieces would have been a big mistake. Much better keep those bishops together where they're going to be controlling every square on the board, potentially. And, and so it would have been a big mistake to trade there. So knight d2, g4, nice move, taking away the f3 square, h5, just, just grabbing a little more space. And so now bishop g1, and it just... Material is still equal in this position, but black is totally winning. And so after knight d4, a couple more moves. In this position, white, white resigned because he, he can't defend the pawn. You know, here he, he just, I guess he played bishop f1 and just resigned, but I mean, he can't, uh, it's completely lost. I mean, after it takes, takes, okay, that's two pawns. So black just won one pawn there. These are going to take forever. The e5 pawn is incredibly weak. And the simple plan for black to win is to go like that, <laughs> just to push the H pawn. So this is a fantastic example of how a solid opening strategy against a very dangerous line, you know, can really pay off with long-term positional pressure. So Fisher starts with centralizing his pieces, developing, finally going with B5, and then he just takes off. Now he really grabbed the initiative. H6, you know, really going after the, the dark square bishop is a good idea. If bishop h4, a, a kind of a common positional tactic in this situation is g5. With the idea that after takes, knight e5, critical in between move. And, um, you know, now wherever white's queen goes, let's say uh, knight h7 is really the main idea. Now with the bishop coming. This, this is an awesome example of just positional control in, in this line. And with this controlling all of these squares, you'll see this example quite a bit doing more study on this. Classic. Queen coming to c5. Maybe this knight reroutes, reinforces e5. So anyway, um, moving on here, I'm going to take a look at one of Kasparov's games in this line. And we'll, we'll take a look at how this is a little bit different from Fisher's approach. So Kasparov, this is a game, uh, we have the Armenian IM, Levon Aeolian versus Kasparov, 1976. And Kasparov, 
He also played the poison pawn variation a little bit with this queen b6 move here, but he more it was more typical to, for him to employ the immediate b5 line. And this is quite an interesting line. So if e5 immediately, you might be thinking black is in trouble. So he's going to lose a knight or something. First of all, h6 would be, a mo would be possible, something like this. Although I think there are some complications, maybe with queen f3 coming. Maybe, maybe immediately, maybe after some exchanges. I, I think this, I don't know, it's a little complicated. I think better in this position after e5, if takes, takes. Queen c7, I believe, is the line where if you takes the knight, this check, you're going to pick up that bishop, good dark squares, should be a good game for black. Anyway, it is worth mentioning. So b5, and uh, okay, a3 by white. You don't see this a3 move so much. This game was in the mid-70s, so they were still developing theory. Much more common, I believe, would be queen to f3 immediately. So... Here, bishop b7, just putting a little bit of pressure. Queen e2, this is, a, this is kind of one of those weird lines. And it, it goes with the a3 idea because you want to keep the knight here on e4. Uh, but, you know, it's, I don't know, I'm not crazy about this queen e2 stuff. Here, the g4 idea. And we can see uh, Kasparov and Fischer had, it's a similar structure now. But the difference really lies in the fact the early b5 is more committal. And you're really signaling to white that's what you're going to play and not any lines associated with an early knight c6 by black, for example. So with g4, white is just putting pressure. It was really getting ready to roll the pawns, queen b6. And this was a fairly strange move, but I, I do understand the reasoning of not wanting to give up the dark square bishop. It makes a lot of sense. So at knight c5... Bishop g2, and Kasparov plays the weirdest plan in this game. And I was impressed by this kind of straightforward idea. He, he goes immediately to knight a4. And I, I don't know. I mean, I, I thought he could have at least castled first, but, you know, maybe castles, maybe he's going to run into something with e5, you know, and hitting that bishop. So he goes knight a4, and the king can go kingside or queenside, really, in this position. But after knight a4... These doubled pawns look weird, but the open B file is really going to help black out. So now G5. And white has, white has a really nice idea uh, of rerouting the bishop all the way back where it's going to be, you know, attack and defense from C3. And it turns out, after rook B8, the bishop, Kasparov just immediately targets it. So rook C8, bishop A8, he does everything to sack, on, sack for the bishop. So white maybe could have defended a little bit, you know, but it, I don't know. I mean, rook here maybe it just allows this. It, it just, um, I don't know. It seems kind of weird. And, and so he plays queen g4. It's kind of a race, you know, who's going to get there first. Kasparov just sacks the rook. Now knight c5, bringing another piece in. Nice pressure here. If f5, I suppose, e5 was possible. And so... You know, that's, that's what Kasparov played in the game here. Um, yeah, I, I mean, you just, you got to go a5. There's, there's no reason to allow the f file to be open. That's only going to help white. And so now with d5, Kasparov just goes nuts. And this, you know, he already sacked the exchange. He's following it up. I believe white could have taken. Then we see check. King here. And I think knight b3 check could be answered by king d3, as interesting as this looks. And I think black doesn't have anything else than, than throwing some checks. Or maybe black just takes the pawn on a3, and now all of a sudden this pawn on a4 is going to be seriously dangerous. And it seems like white's attack with these pawns is going to be too slow for black's attack with his pieces. So d5, pretty interesting move. And white, instead, f6 was a mistake. It allows knight takes e4. Now black really is threatening mate as the d2 square is covered. And black hits, he, he captures a3 with check. But in this position, I mean, the pawn on f6, it looks scary, but pawns take a long time to break through, especially, you know, this is why you don't move pawns in front of your king. Because now it just, it gives white nothing to latch onto. So Kasparov sends the pawn on a march. C4 to open up some defense. E3, cutting off the coordination. And now Bishop D4 just ends the game. 
the, the queen can't continue watching that. Uh, rook takes, that's not going to work for white. And so here, black, white tries to bail out, sacrifice the queen. In queen f4, he just resigned. There's, there's no way to stop the mate. It's just, it's all over. You know, there's no point in continuing. So looking at Kasparov's line, early b5. I like it. I, I think it's good. You know, I mean, you gotta you gotta know a little bit about the e5 stuff here, but it's, honestly, it's not that complicated. As this check, I, I think it talks. It speaks for itself. I mean, you just two bishops. Um, queen f3 maybe is a little dicey, but I think the rook will swing on the seventh rank back in the game just fine. And um, yeah, this this is a, a pretty solid line. I mean, also you could say, if, let's say something like. This, maybe the queen is going to come to e5, just make the king a little uncomfortable as well. So, anyway, uh, this, you know, Fisher, the poison pawn variation is absolutely psychotic, and I'm glad I stayed away from it from the series. And, you know, it really shows, I mean, Kasparov goes, his approach to the knight orf really is more instant, instant gratification. You know, he goes straight for... Hey, you know, notice just studying his games, he, he really tries to go for the queenside counterplay right off the bat and prefers to ignore moving his king until he absolutely has to. And while Fisher maybe employed kind of calmer lines, um, a little bit less tactical preparation and more based on general long-term positional strategic ideas. This is Will Stewart from OnlineChessLessons.net. Thanks for tuning in.